the panel. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna open. Sorry, we're missing one person, but uh, if if they come in, you know, we can all you know, embarrass them or whatever whatever's appropriate. Uh, I'm sure you got them, so it's fine. Uh, so this panel is called Writing the Other. Um, and to, to give you a brief summary of basically what this panel is about is what, we're, what we'll all be talking about and what hopefully you guys can ask questions about as well or discuss is uh, some of the, the challenges in writing protagonists uh, or characters outside of your own experience. Um, and so, you know, that may be a, a man writing a, a, a female character, uh, you know, a straight person writing a, 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 a gay person, um, all, all sorts of different, you know, uh, different things and how you, how you make that experience authentic and, and, and interesting. So, that's kind of where I want to start, uh, but first I want to let everybody in the panel just introduce themselves briefly and just talk about their work. So we can start down here with Kate and then we'll get back. Okay, I'm Kate Hulk. I Well, I'm not sure that there's any anything that's really safe from me, although <laughs> what I'm published in is mostly on the fantasy end. And so far, so far mostly it has been first-person point of view of males. In one case, the male is Vlad the Impaler. In another case, it's a vampire. So I don't go, I don't take the easy route. I do things differently, usually without even realizing I'm doing anything different. Oh. Jennifer? I'm Jennifer Posey. I'm a published novelist and very prolific writer of short fiction. So I've written all sorts of different protagonists. And this girl is one of the three protagonists in my novel, and the other of a man, a man, and an alien. <laughs> so, and I've written quite several stories from the viewpoints of non-human characters, and I have a friend of mine, that, that's the other to me, and all sorts of different sexualities, and different settings, and different cultures. So, when you write a lot of short fiction, you have to come up with a lot of protagonists. <laughs> you can't make them all like you or draw it. Oh, hi. How you doing? Uh, my name is Rod Belcher. Sorry, I'm late. Sorry. It's everyone. <laughs> I've been saying that a lot this weekend. Um, um, I write under the name R.S. Belcher. Um, this is my first novel. Uh, it's called The Six Gun Tarot. Uh, it was released last year. I uh, have a sequel that's coming out, and I have two other books that are not related to this universe uh, that Tor uh, Books is also publishing, one in 2015, which is an urban fantasy, uh, and then one in 2016, which I'm writing right now, which is hopefully the start of a new series that's also kind of southern fried urban fantasy. So <laughs> I like that term. Uh, um, and, it sounds uh, delicious. <laughs> Chicken fried, so no. um, but uh, I, I'm very excited about this panel. Um, several of the characters in Six Gun um, are deliberately designed to sort of uh, be against kind of the, the traditional mold of some of the kind of Western tropes. Um, I have uh, the mayor of the town is Mormon. He is homosexual. Uh, one of the main characters in the, the book uh, is a woman who in 1869, Nevada, uh, having a female character sort of as an action hero is kind of a little against the, you know, the grain of traditional Westerns. Um, have some uh, Native American characters in there as well. Uh, so it was a lot of fun and very enlightening to, to try to do that in the book. Uh, my name is T. Eric Bakutis. I'm a game designer and author. Uh, game design, I recently released a little uh, independent game called The Elder Scrolls Online, which some of you may have heard of. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm also an author. Uh, so this is this is my, my first book. Um, actually, I was I haven't mentioned this yet, but I was, I was actually really thrilled. Uh, it was uh, selected as a finalist for the Compton Crook at Balticon this year. So awesome. I was really happy about that. Um, so if you're coming to Balticon, come by and see me. Um, but yeah, and uh, I, kind of similar to, to other people up here, the, the, the main character in Glyphbinder is actually a, a, a woman. And so that's a little of what I'm going to talk about is, is you know, uh, my journey to actually being able to, I hope, uh, write female characters well. Um, I'm Paula Jordan. I write um, character-driven, moderately hard science fiction. I'm currently working on a series of stories and a novel, um, an Alien Contact. Uh, present day um, uh, mountains of western North Carolina. 
Um, I, as a result, I'm very interested in aliens and um, have done a good bit of thinking about them lately. Uh, last week I had a guest post on uh, Fantasy Cafe uh, on the design of aliens. Um, my thinking behind it, why they interest me. So if anybody's interested in that sort of thing, I'd recommend that to you. Um, and I also blog regularly on darkcargo.com. All right, so what I'm going to do is we're going to have a few questions up here. I'm going to keep an eye on the time, and I'm going to try to open it up to questions uh, about uh, 30 minutes in. Uh, if nobody has questions, we'll go on and you know, do, some, do some bonus questions. But I guess I want to start with kind of what we talked about originally, which is basically I'd like, I'd like each of you to, to, to talk about a, an example of a protagonist you wrote that was outside of your experience. Uh, some of the ch some of the challenges you encountered and how you tackled them. So, I'll, we'll start with this you. is okay. Well, this is not so much a single pro protagonist in the novel that I'm working on. I have a series of ordinary people, but from different backgrounds, and they each of them meet or learn about the presence of aliens unexpectedly. And this is the kind of shock that would be um, pretty serious in anybody's experience. Uh, how would we react to it? Who knows? Well. I found a book, which helps. Uh, back in the 1930s, a group of Australian gold prospectors went into the center of, of the island of New Guinea for the first time. Deep, isolated valley, uh, valleys behind the mountains. Nobody knew they were there. Hundreds of thousands of Stone Age people who had never seen white people. <coughs> this is a picture of those people first encountering um, white-skinned people. Now you can't see the you can't see the expressions from back there. So at the end of this, if you're interested and you have the time, come and take a look. But each one of these people reacts in a different way. And there's there's curiosity, there's bafflement, there's terror, there's just just disbelief. Dis complete disbelief. And there's a different story for every one of them there. So this is helping me a lot working on that. <coughs> so what was, what was one of the challenges that, that you guys, was it just learning to write from that perspective? Learning to write from that perspective and how a person would react. Mm -hmm. And everybody is different. What, what take they would, they would have emotionally, what would they, their response be? And as the book goes on, what would their, their long term? response likely be. So this was a resource that gave you some real world uh, yes. examples that you could draw on to make them. And the only one that I could think of that could possibly do that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so the question is challenges? And, uh, and so yeah, the protagonist that you wrote outside of your experience, challenges you encountered, how you tackled them. Um, when uh, one, of the, one of the premises I wanted to do with, uh, with Six Gun was um, kind of a little twin peaksy sort of thing. I wanted to make this town where everybody had some kind of a secret going on. Everyone had some kind of weirdness to them. Um, and sometimes it's hard to, to do that and still kind of ground the characters so people give a damn about them. <laughs> but uh, the character of Maud Stapleton, um, is she is uh, introduced in a way that uh, she seems to be just kind of a bystander, almost kind of like you know, an extra. In the, in the story. And then a couple chapters later, you, you start to find out more about her backstory. Um, I really wanted um, to, to present in Maud um, the perspective of a woman living in a society where at the time she could not own property. Um, the state, in, in most states, considered uh, a woman to be like a child who couldn't take care of her own finances, could not take care of, of any kind of responsibility. And the frustration that that would engender, and and also just from Maud's point of view, Maud's character, and I want to, want to bore you with all the details if you really want to know, you can go out and buy the book, and it's in paperback now, it's a little tiny, it's cheap, it's no good. Um, <laughs> but uh, Maud also has had this, uh, this backstory where she has had this very empowering sort of training. She, she is probably the most badass person in this book. And she's had to live kind of behind a mask for decades. She has a child, so she is a mother. Um, and it was, it was an interesting challenge because I really wanted people to, to empathize with her.
uh, and root for. And I've actually gotten a lot of really good feedback about Maud, which is kind of awesome. Um, some folks have actually wanted me to try to do like a whole little story on Maud and her her family, her mentor who kind of teaches her all this stuff. So, so what did what helped you write for that character? Um, actually, the thing that really did it the most for for Maud was I, I just kind of pulled from the experiences of the women in my life. Um, uh, there was a woman I saw for about five or six years. We were together. Um, I saw some of her struggles. Uh, my mother and my sister raised me by themselves. Um, so I got kind of to grow up seeing women having to kind of, and my mom, you know, was a single mother in an age before that was really socially acceptable. So it was, it was hard on her. She, she ran businesses and she raised two children by herself. And I got to see firsthand how that affected her and how society sort of interacted with her. So I tried to pull a lot of that into Maud. I hope I succeeded. Because at the end of the day, all I can do is, is hope that if someone comes, reads it and says, OK, I get that. I understand it. I think I pulled it off. But yeah, that was, um, I drew from, from I guess, like family experiences and personal experiences mm -hmm. to try to get inside Maud's head. Well, I'm, go I'm going to bring up the most alien character I have ever written, who was I Ray, the protagonist of my analog story, a star to steer by, who is a spaceship. Mm. The protagonist of this story was the AI brain of a spaceship. And the real challenge was, how do I get, I don't know how well I did it. I did it well enough to impress a very high level editor. Other than that, was keeping the character relatable whilst having people work. This is a computer. This is a computer which she still has emotions. This is a sentient AI in a difficult situation. And that was a that was a real challenge to balance the to balance the other and I'm sure you were sent to an alien, to balance the otherness of something that isn't human with the relatability that you have to have to make your human audience go, Yes, I can see why that character did that. I can see why that character made that decision in that point for particularly challenging a short story. Okay. okay, I'm going to take this from a slightly different angle because all of us write science fiction or fantasy. By definition, the vast majority of what we do is going to be other. We can't help it. Even if we're writing normal people, something weird is going to arrive. <laughs> so it's kind of like, you mean this stuff isn't normal? <laughs> oh, okay. So, when I was writing Impaler, the first thing I did was a whole lot of research into the era. I wanted to get the mindset of people in that time in history. Because you take people from the mid to late 1400s in Europe, in Eastern Europe, you might as well be looking at aliens. They had completely different ideas of how everything was supposed to be. Totally different ideas about what different classes of people did, about how the world was supposed to work, about things like who paid for what, about war, about what was appropriate when somebody does something wrong. All these things were part of a general worldview that said, OK, somebody steals someone steals a loaf of bread, it is perfectly acceptable and normal to kill them. That was a fairly common penalty in that time. So, I, having gotten that mindset, then I started looking at Vlad himself and how much he differed from that mindset, which was not very much. He wasn't, he was no worse than any of his contemporaries. And I started looking at the various aspects of his life. Things like, you know, what his childhood was like, which was not that, un it, it wasn't that different from any of his contemporaries. Every single one of his contemporaries was also held for ransom with their life at stake if their father or senior older brother or whoever it was didn't behave. All of them. Hardly any wonder that they all ended up stabbing each other in the back. 
Except Rudd didn't. He actually kept his word, which is one of the interesting things about him. And you know, I gradually <laughs> built up mentally this picture of who this guy was, what drove him. Yes, you translate him here right now, people would look at him as an absolute utter psycho. In his world, in his environment, he was a bit more extreme than normal, but well and truly within the usual ranges. <coughs> he just pissed off the wrong people. So he got a really bad rap because of bad propaganda. And writing him was really an exercise in letting all of that information that I had had seep in. It wasn't so much a challenge of getting him right as getting out of his mind when I needed to stop. Because it really doesn't go over very well when you start suggesting that you're going to impale errant programmers for putting <laughs> stupid bugs in their software, <laughs> which you have to test. Aside from anything else, it's really bloody difficult to get blood out of carpet. <laughs> so uh, we'll move on to that. Uh, no. <laughs> so I, I'm just going to be real brief, but uh, but I'm going to talk about kind of what inspired this this panel for me, and it, it comes from you know I started writing at a very uh, young age, you know probably six or seven, um, and I think I wrote my first uh, you know complete novel uh, at, at like 14. Uh, my son experience with the opposite sex at that time was not not ex that extensive. So basically what, what the challenge I encountered is is my first writers group in Texas who were terrific, amazing writers, also all women. And they were very, very good at, at pointing out, you know, I had the I had this novel that I'd written and I had a, a, a hero and a heroine and it's like, yeah, the hero is really relatable, but we really, we really don't like this, this female. I was like, but she's, she's great. It's like, no, she's not. Um, so it was, you know, it was just a matter of, of you know, how do I, as a, as kind of a young man, how do I, how do I write uh, a, a good female character? And and what it really came down to, and I think this actually applies to a lot of what we talk about, is what I started thinking about in my writing when I was writing, whether it was a male or female, uh, is trying to to take the cliche out, like do whatever you can to avoid cliches and think of your protagonist as the protagonist and not as a male or female necessarily. And what I mean by that is uh, two quick examples. Uh, if your protagonist sees a child kind of huddle on the road and thinks, oh, I wish I could adopt them, they should not think that because they have a maternal instinct. They should think that because they are a good person who likes children. If your protagonist is on the road with their party and they're lost and the protagonist says, I'm not gonna ask for directions, I'm gonna fight my way through, should not be because they're male, it should be because they're stubborn and they, they, they don't want to ask for So but but you see what it is, it's just it's it's your character is doing things because that is what your character would do, not because they are male or female. Um, or an alien or whatever that is. So I just try to write whether male or female, I just like what would what would this character do in this situation? And uh, at least from the feedback I've gotten from you know that writer's group and others, they said, yeah, you, your female characters are much more relatable now. And obviously the character in this book, the main character is female. So, um, so yeah. So the, the the next place I'd I'd like to go, uh, since we we ended with like blood on blood on the carpet, uh, <laughs> uh, there, um, it, it's kind of like. And I've talked a little about this, so I'm just going to let you guys talk about it already. But but some of the common mistakes that writers make uh, when writing outside their own experience. So. So it, it, not only what those mistakes are, but but how to avoid them. So uh, let's let's go ahead and start with Kate, and then we'll come up this way. Some of the common mistakes are they're all the same person with a different name or a different hair color or a different something or other attached, which comes back to your your comment there about you know you're writing a person. Mm -hmm. The other bits are part of what make that person who they are. They are not the whole and the sum total of that person. You can write a strong, interesting guy who happens to be turned on by other guys. Sarah Hoyt did it in A Few Good Men. And boy oh boy did she do that. There is absolutely no question that her main character is a action-oriented, very act, very physically fit, very macho guy in a lot of ways. He just happens to be turned on. That's part of who he is. He's, 
he is about as far from your what one might be called your stereotypical gay guy as it's possible to get and still have a dick. <laughs> <laughs> so you're looking at the sum that that's how you get around that particular problem. The other one you get is the um, the girls with the girls with a penis or the guys with boob syndrome, where you get they all seem to have the same the um, stereotypical viewpoint of and you get female you get women who act like a ma like a typical man would act in a situation and or you get guys who emote the way a typical high school girl would do in a situation and believe me anyone who thinks that women are sweeter and kinder and nicer than men <laughs> has never been in an all-girl classroom. <laughs> Jennifer, do you want to follow that up? <laughs> I've been in an all-girl classroom. <laughs> uh, first of all, I agree. I think a lot of the time we get characters, particularly sexuality, where people write a gay character a lesbian character but you don't write a straight character <laughs> when you want and um, people write a black character you don't write a right character you need to make sure that these characters are characters that happen to be gay mm -hmm. happen to be black happen to be asian and the other thing that i come across a lot is what i call the other paralysis I can't write that, I might get it wrong and then the people in that group will get mad with me. <laughs> I'll get mad anyway. <laughs> Just write it. <laughs> and there's ways of getting around that with the, a lot of younger writers have this, and I've gone through it myself, this paralysis of, <coughs> I couldn't possibly write a black character. I couldn't do it, I could never do that right. I, and I went through that and I'm like, I still haven't written that many black <coughs> characters. But, what I do have, I do have on sort of published with a black protagonist, and nobody complained, so I figure I got it more or less right. But there's avoiding that paralysis of being afraid that you're going to get something wrong and offend a minority is really something I just have to battle with. Um, I would absolutely agree with what, what she just said. Um, when you build when you're building these characters um a lot of the things we're discussing here that i'm that that you're writing about that's not from your perspective um you do want to try to do justice to that individual uh and that group you want to make sure you're at least trying to uh, research a little bit you go out and and I have a character in uh, Nightwives who is a transgender uh, indigenous Australian sorceress. I am none of those. <laughs> so, um, I, uh, but I, I have uh, friends that have known folks who are transgender, and uh, I, I, can, I can take that experience and I can talk to those folks. I can look back on the experiences I know they've had in their lives, the troubles they've had. Uh, I started researching and found that there's this, there's a whole, there's a whole, you know, interesting little subculture uh, in uh, uh, indig indigenous Australian people having to do with transgender folks. So, which actually opened up a whole bunch of cool stuff for the character. It, it actually produced more, more story, more, more backstory. So, um, it's really. It's really important not to to start out with the premise. If, if you're describing your character as <laughs> this, this, and this, and this, or, you know, transgender, that that's not what that character is. That character is a person. They have a name. They have a backstory. Part of that backstory is is whatever their sexual orientation is, whatever uh, whatever their their race, the minority, the, the minority status they have, any of those things. That stuff is part of them. It's going to mold the character. And that's all backstory. And that's really, it, it, it's, 
in your best interest as a writer, if you really want to try to make this an authentic reading person, is to research it. And the best way to research it is to talk to someone that you know you either know or go and make some new friends. <laughs> and basically just try to try to get it right. And uh, I've found that in my experience, folks are actually kind of flattered when you when you want to talk to them about that and, and make sure that you're getting it right because they've read a lot of stuff, or they've seen a lot of stereotypical stuff that's that's not them. Mm-hmm. And they, they actually kind of like the fact that you're trying to uh, represent them uh, fairly and, and realistically. Yeah, getting 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 uh, feedback from the, the type of you know the, the, the role that you're writing is, is always tremendous. Paula, do you have anything you want to add? Well, I just sort of thinking of reading summation of what the folks have said. Um, it seems um, one theme is that. If this is a human character, then the humanity is more important yes. mm-hmm. yeah. than any of the other yes. mm-hmm. um, differences yeah. that they may have. And um, the backstory is without value. I mean, it's just, it's without, it's more than, than you could have put a value on. Um, not only for being able to know your character well and to give other influences for their life uh, than the obvious one. Um, to have a full and complete backstory that will tell you more about them at every step in the writing of the book than um, than anything else that you could come up with on the spur of the moment. Uh, they won't all be in there, but uh, when you need information, it's where it is. And um, also there are biographies. There are... Um, biographies, autobiographies, yeah. Yeah, great and autobiographies of people of, of so many varied experiences mm-hmm. that um, and they can be found. That's a really great resource. Um, so we're about uh, close to 30 minutes in, I think. So we, we can keep going, but I actually want to see if there's any questions in the audience. If anybody wants to ask a question or has any any thoughts that have come up, and start over here. And yeah. How much work has he gone into doing you know, different cultures, non-Western culture backgrounds? Has any of you worked on that sort of problem before? <laughs> uh, which Western culture would you like to take? <laughs> Medieval Eastern Europe of the um, Wallachian flavor is completely different to medieval Eastern Ottoman, is completely different again to Hungary of the same time period. Which one would you like to choose? That's before you even start with the multiple the cultural flavors that live in this country. I mean, every single person in this room belongs to a culture that is not shared by what might be called the mainstream. We are all oddities. We're nerds, we're geeks, we're different. Yeah. So, <laughs> we're all individuals together. <laughs> we are always failed to organize. So, <laughs> one in a million, just like everybody else. Yes. Yeah. So, it doesn't actually matter which culture you happen to go diving into. You can go diving into, ver- I've gone diving into multiple multiple different cultures, all sorts of flavors. You know, they're as different as, that, as you want them to be. You can find points of similarity in any culture. You can find points of difference. It doesn't, I don't really see that big of a, a thing over whether it's based in, based out of the, the European experience or based out of somewhere else. It's a culture, there are people. Anything else is just added richness and fluff. Uh, you find me, oh. no. Well, actually, uh, did anybody have anything to add to that? Oh, you find me, I, I just want to add that uh, I was born and raised in Portugal. I once got a long comment in Portuguese on my blog because I write a lot of historical stuff saying, why are you writing historical stuff set in England and not in Portugal? We have (laughs) 900 years of history you could mine. And it's like, yes, and I do mine it, but mostly I mine it for my fantasies. There is a reason for this. I actually have a trilogy set in Victorian Africa, India, and China. And I was warned multiple times, this will not sell. Well, I sold it to Bantam, but it did not sell that well. People, if you see something about the wives of Henry VIII, 
you're going to pick it up because, oh yeah, that's familiar territory, and I'll get it. I wonder what you really thought. Yeah. I find that really sad. So we have a question up in the back. And then... uh, more a comment okay. than a question. Uh, and uh, about uh, the earlier or talk of uh, being afraid to write someone, or write a character from a minority or marginalized group mm -hmm. because uh, of the fear of getting something wrong and offending people. And even with all the research in the world, uh, if you write characters of marginalized and uh, minority groups that you're not part of, eventually you're going to get something wrong and and someone's going to point it out to you. They may or may not be polite about it. <laughs> <laughs> but whether or not they're polite, uh, the important thing to do is not to get defensive about it. Uh, apologize. Mm -hmm. Is ask, oh, well, oh, exactly what is wrong about it? What would be better? Can you point me at some resources that I might have missed? And use it as a learning moment, not a moment to get really defensive and just and burn and out then people. And then three days later, somebody else from that same group will come up to you and say, this is my life. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and yeah. the other thing, yeah. if you that's are good, worried, that's good if you are worried about getting it right, the best thing you can do is track down somebody in that community and get them to read it first. That's the, that's the best way. Two or three people, ideally, from that community you know, if you if you're writing a book with a gay guy and you're worried that you're stereotyped, and find a couple of gay guys to read it. They're plenty, you know. <laughs> <laughs> not that it's not that hard, especially with the internet. Um, right, you like to, I just wanted to address that. I can I have a I can divide my my mail for for this into. Um, thank you for fi finally you know seeing something in print about someone who's like me. That's awesome. Yay you. To you misogynist jerk. <laughs> or misogynist, you know, just fill in a blank there. You racist, misogynist, homophobic jerk. How how dare you? You don't know what you're talking about. And I've, I've discovered, because the first time I got one of those, I was like, oh, oh God, oh no. No, that's not me. Um, and instead of, and you're absolutely right, instead of coming at it from anger, you have no idea what you're talking about. That was what I was trying to do. You're crazy. To, to fear. I have discovered that what's really worked well is if you respond to those people very Socratically, very open to, okay, what what exactly in this offended you? And let's talk this out. And I've actually I've actually had some reviewers where that was their, their sticking point. They, they really didn't like. One of the things I get a lot is um, offended by the language from the 19th century uh, are offended by the racist, sexist attitudes of the 19th century. I'm writing about the 19th century. It's it's fantasy. It's got all sorts of little woohoo magic stuff in it, but it's still grounded in a time which is very different than our present time. So I found that sometimes if I if I address those those criticisms with very kind of open heart and sort of what what I do exactly that you didn't like, um, even if they still don't like what I did. They seem to be much more receptive to. Okay, well, you know, I'm, I'm still going to read your next book and, <laughs> and see how, you know, see if you got it right this time. And that's and, the only thing that matters. And, and that's all right. That's very important. Um, but it's nice to always, you know, end a conversation with someone who disagrees with you, and it's not, it's not confrontational. It's you guys have, have both shared your experiences, and and I've gotten something from it. And I try to take. Uh, there, there are things I've written in the sequel that are different than what I did in Six Gun because of some of the feedback I got. So I think it's a very valid and, and very, very uh, good comment to make. Thank Unfortunately you. Unfortunately for me, Vlad is not going to come and tell me I got it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you hope not. Yeah. I really hope not. Love on the carpet. I think we had a, I think we had a question over here. Right. Yeah, uh, similar vein. And it's, uh, have any of you ever not written a character because of your concerns about the reactions? And I'm thinking more along the Solomon Rushdie type thing. <laughs> I'm writing a story right now where one of my characters is a slave Muslim soldier who is now in Northern Europe during the age of the Vikings. And I'm trying to write it as carefully as I can, but the whole time I'm writing it, it's like, 
do I really want to go there? Um, for me, the answer is no. Mm -hmm. I am, in fact, horribly disappointed that I haven't had, as you had declared against me, war <laughs> in pain. Fatwa. I, I am horribly disappointed that I have not been fatwa. There's I always really the next get, book. There's always, there's always sequels. But you have to have goals. Yes. <laughs> I mean, let's face it. If somebody is, if someone is offended by facts, and I can point to the facts behind every single incident in the book. And there's a lot of people who are offended by facts out there. Oh yes. <laughs> but if they are offended by facts, that is their problem. That is not my problem. And if someone wants to come after me personally over that, well, you know, there's, um, well, for starters, there's my husband with his uh, 45 calibers of, you are not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> An excellent retort. Yes, indeed. <laughs> A fairly loud one at that. <laughs> My nine millimeters are the same thing. Um, <laughs> there's also uh, the simple fact that I am not going to sit down and shut up because I am scared of what someone else is mm. going to get upset about. If people are getting that upset about it, it needs to be talked about and getting scared and shutting up is absolutely the wrong thing to do. Bring it out in the open, talk about it, get the poisonous emotions out. Because if you don't, they will just fester and it will get worse. And so, you know, the truth. If there's truth to be told, it gets told. If a his particular piece of history is ugly, fine, it's ugly. It's still going to go in that book. I am not going to shut up over something because I'm scared of what someone else is going to say or think or scream at me over. They can scream it. That's their problem. <laughs> if they try to do anything, well, I'll give them a few other problems to worry about. <laughs> I've got sort of a different um, a little change of direction here. We've been talking about writing in a culture, in a time, being appropriate to the, the environment that the characters are in. Um, I have read a few books. I'm thinking of the Brother Cadfile books. Um, mm -hmm. Histories. I can't yeah. remember the, the writer's name. She was wonderful. Else Peters. Yes. He was a, a uh, crusader who went home and became a monk. So he has a broad view of the medieval world, but he has a modern mind. For a reason, for some reason that, that the author never gave us, he gave us a modern perspective of what it would be like to be in that culture at that time. It took, it was very interesting. The first time I read one, I felt like this book is going so slowly. <laughs> but he was moving at, he was, he was, everywhere he went, he walked. Mm. Or he rode a, a donkey. Mm. He was moving, a modern mind, moving at a snail's pace. And that, I thought, was such a dramatic setting for the time and gave me a better picture of the time and place than I think I would have had. And that's that's really a, that's, yeah. that's great writing because yes. you're taking your experience now and you're and you're being projected back into another time and another person's shoes, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. Anybody have anything else to say about that? I I have not ever not listen to character because I was afraid people would be offended. I have, I have put something on a shelf for a little bit of time to let it percolate because I'm like, I have a book in the pipeline and I'm not sure what I'm going to do with it, which does have a transgender character, and that one I was a little nervous about. But, but that's still in edit, somewhere in my massive stack of things to be edited. <laughs> Um, we have, have one up here. Yeah. question. Sure. You said, and I think this is primarily you, but lots of people echoed it. <coughs> you said that, um, let's say, for example, uh, writing a female character mm -hmm. to not stick to these female character stereotypes. Or a male character. Or, or a female about. character yeah. not to stick to the male character stereotypes. Um, but at the same time, somebody else, you, said, don't write a male character who does stereotypical female things, mm -hmm. or vice versa. Mm -hmm. And that sounds to me like the second 
piece of advice is telling you that you should make your character stereotypically uh, sexist. No, Where, no. That, and I don't see how you can re reconcile yeah. those two. So, well, well, <laughs> we can, well, you can, yeah. you can do I'll, that. I, I want to talk start. about it briefly, though, just, yeah. just to explain. Yeah. Uh, what I, when I say not to write a stereotype, uh, a stereotypical character, what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say there is don't let your protagonist's actions be influenced necessarily, like they shouldn't make a decision because I personally think this is how a woman would react. It would be more along the lines of, I know this character, I know their backstory, I know how they think, I know what kind of world they live in, and I'm going to have them react based on those factors, rather than reacting, oh, because she's a girl, or because he's a guy to do this. And not I, I not think, a knee-jerk reaction. Yeah, not a, not a knee-jerk, yeah. yeah. So, so that's kind of the distinct, that's the way I think yeah, about that, it. Yeah, that's pretty much where I am from, too, it is, what that person who lives in this particular environment, be it alien, historical, ordinary, what other people would consider ordinary, no matter what, what this person with their personal history, with their life experience, what they would do in that situation. Mm -hmm. It doesn't become, it, it shouldn't ever be either, oh, she's a girl, she's got to like pink, or oh, she's a girl, she's got to like blue because pink would be stereotypical. That, that's just creating cardboard, if you're lucky. Usually there's even less depth to it. Yeah, and, and the other thing I think I would add is that, is that there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong with having uh, a male or female character that does fit what you would expect, but they should, not, they should not fit that way because they're male or female, they should fit that way because they're raised that way. So I think a, one example that jumps to mind is, is from uh, Sansa from, from Game of Thrones, where a lot of people you know, really don't like her character in the books, but she's, she's not written the way she is because she's female. She's written the way she is because she was very sheltered you know, growing up. She always had, you know, her, she always had to be the, the oldest uh, the oldest, you know, woman. So she's going to get married. She's she's read all these stories about princes and fairy tales. So she's not the way she is in the books uh, because she's female. She's it's because of her background and because of the way she was brought up. So and I would also say so she's I cliche in some sense. But I actually yeah. find Sansa quite a strong character because no matter what happens to her, she stays like that, mm -hmm. and she stays like that even when, and she's still. Want, she, she wants to be the lady, and she still wants to be the lady, and she has, and in a, the end, it starts, in at least in the books, to be very much what she is actually choosing to be like that, and there is nothing wrong with choosing to be a to fit those stereotypes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. she's she's not like yeah she's not that way because she's female. She's that way because that's her character, exactly. and that's a distinction to make. Exactly. And, yeah. and I actually had something. If I can throw something really in quick, sure. um, the character of Maud Stapleton, the, the, the kind of the main female lead in this. Um, some of the feedback that I've gotten is Maud is a, a mother. She has a daughter. Uh, there has been I've had some criticism from the fact that she acts in a maternal nature and that, that, that anchors her to some sort of a stereotypical female reaction. I've actually gotten that feedback. And I, and I don't exactly know how to address that because I, I will never be able to, oh, I will never be a mother. I raised two children on my own, so I'm a dad, but I don't have that, that experience. I will never have that experience. It, it seems to me that you can have a character who loves her child and wants to nurture and protect her child, but that does not in any way diminish from her autonomy or or in any, diminish from the character in any way. To be quite honest, if you love and nurture and care for another human being. That's a that's a positive. That's a net positive. That shouldn't. I don't see how that can be used as. A, but uh, for some folks, that is considered a stereotype. Motherhood is a stereotypical yeah. thing. That's you know uh, in some way limiting of. of, of Female empowerment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, and you didn't approach it that way because she was female. She said she's a mother. She this is this yes. is her character. And again, and so that's exactly exactly yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. and so I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. ahead. I was going to say another mistake is to think that every mother does it the same way. Exactly. Yes. yes. They don't. Every every parenting experience has to be different from every other because the right. children are all different. Yeah. And not every woman wants to be a mother. That's that's quite possible. Awesome. So we've got like. Mm -hmm. uh, a few minutes left, so we'll try to get in two quick questions. We'll get you both in, that'll be awesome. So I was actually more of a comment. Okay. Th this is an argument that I've had that I think sheds light with feminist friends, that they flip out about, 
oh, motherhood, you're playing into the patriarchy. And I'm like, no, I'm not, I don't want to be, I am a mother. I, my son's turning one on Monday. I'm a mother because I wanted to be a mom. And yeah, I'm still independent. I still think for myself. I still hold down a job. I still write novels in the evenings and weekends. But I wanted to be a mom. And there's nothing wrong with being a feminist and also choosing some of the traditional roles. And there's nothing wrong with not choosing the traditional roles. The whole point of feminism is that you get the choice. (laughs) And I think, so your character, she's a strong woman, but she chose motherhood. And what was your thought about that? Oh, I was going to ask, Kate brought up an interesting point, and I was interested in what the rest of you thought about um, historical accuracy when it is offensive, especially to a large group of people. Mm Because that's always difficult, right? If you're having characters that are set in the early 1800s on a ship and someone's convicted of sodomy, you know, and they're all very homophobic about it or they have their sort of the typical attitudes at the time, your readers are going to say, wow, that's awful. All these people are terrible, you know, or they might, right? Oh, yeah. How do you you decide when to change your characters enough to make them relatable to your audience versus historical... I, oh, you got it. I think the important thing is to tell the period properly, to explain what the culture was at the time. A lot of people, for instance, have trouble with Thomas Jefferson not actually freeing his slaves. Mm-hmm. There were dozens of reasons why he could not. Those reasons need to be explained in the course of the story. The reason so people what get the happens aboard that ship has mm-hmm. have to be explained in the context of the story. Yeah. It context is unfair. Yes. It is unfair to accuse any historical figure of something that was commonplace and justifiable by the mores of their time, but not by ours. Right. Absolutely. Yes. And we have no idea what in our time is going to end up being considered contemptible and horrific. I've run into this a lot with Six Gun and with the sequel as well. I'm, the day before I came to the convention, I got uh, my last little round of uh, proof edits back, and I had the term Chinaman in there. Mm-hmm. And the proof editor had <laughs> circled it a couple places, but not very PC. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, I, and I had, and, well, and there was another thing too. There was a, um, a character in there um, that's related to the Donner Party, um, Mrs. Uh-huh. Murphy. And Mrs. Murphy is referred to a lot in the Donner Party uh, documents. Um, and and, and, and the, you know, it was circled as Mrs. And it's like, why are you calling her Mrs.? We haven't been told what her marital status is. A lot of these things are just they're little things from that time period. Yeah. It was considered the I was the honorific of of default. It's for, for mistress. Yeah, yes. and, it, and basically that was what you know women of a certain age were considered to be married. They, they mm-hmm. of course they were married. Why wouldn't they be married? So that was the term that was used. Chinaman is a is offensive, but at the time it was commonly used. And to be quite honest, it's less offensive than a lot of the other terms that were <laughs> thrown around back then. Um, <laughs> So, you know, if I'm writing about 1869 and I have people using modern, uh, politically correct yeah. language, it it's disingenuous to, and, and I'll be honest, I can't do it. I mean, you, you were talking about that, you know, but so, you know, mm-hmm. it's, you, you'll sit there and you'll you'll write it sometimes, you go, God, uh, well, okay, it's, that's, that's accurate. Mm-hmm. And then you just kind of let the chips fall where they may. Stephen King has mentioned in um, On Writing, which is an awesome book, by the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, he basically says that you know he gets accused of everything. But he says, you're, you're, as a writer, you have an obligation to the truth. And, and if your character is a racist, or he's from somewhere where this is the kind of language they would use, and, and dishonest if you don't use that language. And unfortunately, some people do find it hard to separate the political views of a character from the political views of the wrong character. I I Mm -hmm. got slammed by an editor for using a racist term that was being used. The person was quoting something the bad guys had said in a story about racism. It was in there just as a virtual little reminder, these people are racist. <laughs> <laughs> and he made me take it out and yelled at me for being racist. This sounds like mm. something that, you know, this sounds kind of like your editor would 
get all in a flap if you had a an evil Nazi character who hated Jews. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so that's, that's a great place to, to, to wrap up. Uh, so, <laughs> um, so we're right at time. So all, all I want to do, just real briefly, uh, if anybody on the panel has anything they'd like to plug or anything they're doing later that they would love some company on, uh, kind of starting with Paul. Yep, I have this picture if people would like to come up and see it. Also, I, am be, I will be reading from uh, some of my alien stories and my novel in progress tomorrow at noon. Uh, I'm doing uh, a signing for, for this book at 5 p.m. Uh, today, and then I have a reading tomorrow at 11. So if any of you want to come by and keep me from being lonely, I would love to see That's really it. Right. What he said, but at 8 o'clock. <laughs> 8 o'clock today. Uh, today. So today. 8, 8 o'clock will be in the oh, atrium. Uh, it's on. Yeah. It's see? on. See? I'm reading at 8. It's on. <laughs> no, no, no. Go, go to her reading. Okay. I'll listen to some left. music. I'll read reading a little something. Everyone on the right. Um, uh, also, if you're at all interested, or if you've read Six Gun, or you're interested in reading Six Gun, and you like it, the sequel comes out October 7th. Uh, please buy it. My children need to go to college. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reading at 8, but I also wanted to pay something forward. I was at a, pa at a panel on disability last year at Cat Play, where a panelist challenged us all to write a story with a disabled character by the next Cat Play. So I'm going to challenge all the writers in the audience here to write a short story with a protagonist that is outside their experience by next year's Raven card. Challenge accepted. Okay, I have 11 o'clock tonight, The Shrinking of American Heroes. I promise I will try to keep it from getting X-rated. Whether I succeed is anybody's guess. <laughs> and we so back now. Tomorrow morning, in which, which means I'm going to be in an interesting state, comedy in SF and fantasy, which should be a lot of fun. Uh, anybody who is interested in my in, in, in looking up of anything I have written, it, you can get it all from Amazon. Most of it's electronic only. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, Thank for coming you out here. Thank you.